Well, we're going to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Uh, Over the course of the service, we're going to read the whole chapter, but just for now, we'll read verses 1 to 11. This is a very significant chapter of the Bible, and particularly focusing on Jesus' resurrection, that he is alive. And so uh, we're going to read uh, verses uh, 1 to 11 now, um, and then I'm just going to share something briefly with the kids. And we'll take a look at the rest of the chapter a bit later on. So 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning at verse 1. This is Paul writing to the church in Corinth. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. For what I received I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. After that he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James then to all the apostles, and last of all he appeared to me also, as to one abnormally born. For I am the least of the apostles, and do not even deserve to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Whether then it is I or they, this is what we preach, and this is what you believed. So, um, let's turn back to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And uh, really, having presented the facts there, Paul then moves on to talk more about the resurrection of Jesus. Uh, And he talks, as you can see, in some length from verses 12 to 58, the rest of this chapter, about Jesus' resurrection. And there are some things in here which are quite tricky uh, and complex, um, but also glorious and wonderful too. Um, So let's tune in uh, to 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 12. But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God, for we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But he did not raise him if, in fact, the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead also comes through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in turn, Christ the first fruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him. Then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father after he has destroyed all dominion, authority and power for he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death for he has put everything under his feet. Now when it says that everything has been put under him it is clear that this does not include God himself who put everything under Christ. When he has done this, then the Son himself will be made subject to him who put everything under him, so that God may be all in all. 
Now, if there is no resurrection, what will those do who are baptised for the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, why are people baptised for them? And as for us, why do we endanger ourselves every hour? I face death every day, yes, just as surely as I boast about you in Christ Jesus our Lord. If I fought wild beasts in Ephesus with no more than human hopes, what have I gained? If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Come back to your senses as you ought and stop sinning for there are some who are ignorant of God. I say this to your shame. But someone will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body will they come? How foolish what you sow does not come to life unless it dies. When you sow, you do not plant the body that will be, but just a seed, perhaps of wheat or of something else. But God gives it a body as he has determined, and to each kind of seed he gives its own body. Not all flesh is the same. People have one kind of flesh, animals have another, birds another, and fish another. There are also heavenly bodies and there are earthly bodies, but the splendor of the heavenly bodies is one kind and the splendor of the earthly bodies is another. The sun has one kind of splendor, the moon another, and the stars another, and star differs from star in splendor. So will it be with the resurrection of the dead. The body that is sown perishable, it is raised imperishable. It is sown in dishonour, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. So it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being, the last Adam, a life-giving spirit. The spiritual did not come first, but the natural, and after that, the spiritual. The first man was of the dust of the earth, the second man is of heaven. As was the earthly man, so are those who are of the earth, and as is the heavenly man, so also are those who are of heaven. And just as we have borne the image of the earthly man, so shall we bear the image of the heavenly man. I declare to you, brothers and sisters, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God. He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, My dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labour in the Lord is not in vain. Okay, well, good morning, everyone. I don't have, I'm not switched on. I always switch the mic off just in case anyone catches me singing. Uh, it's a bit of a public, uh, public hazard. Um, so just to, just to mention a couple of things uh, that are, that are uh, sort of coming up at Red House Farm, just for information. Ben did apologize to me. He had no need to apologize to me. But uh, just because we're doing something at Red House Farm next week that sort of clashes with the, uh, the, uh, the maintenance day here. And I will tell you just for your information, because we expect you to be here uh, working. Um, so next week we have uh, we have um, our uh, Bible College, uh, our host. We're hosting our Bible College uh, staff, and they're going to be here. Uh, Russell Newton's going to be here, and he's going to be uh, delivering three talks. And uh, it's really on the whole emphasis is on searching Scripture, Christ-like living, Christ-like reading, for Christ-like living. So uh, if you know anyone who's not involved in the cleanup day next week who would like to come, you can give them a little bit of an invite. And uh, just something else that's coming up in the more distant future 
is uh, something that we've been really uh, sort of gearing up for even pre-COVID. Uh, we are inviting the um, co counties evangelists. They've got this uh, sort of high-tech uh, Bible exhibition and uh, we are hiring it off them for a week. We're setting it up at the center and uh, we are busing kids in from, from local schools to, uh, to come and do a, a, a session. So we have, I think we've got about eight sessions. Uh, we've got uh, Weather and Set School are coming in, Weather and Set uh, Year 5 and 6, uh, Stoneham Aspel Year 5 and 6, Creating St. Mary Year 5 and 6, uh, uh, Rattleston Year 5 and 6, and uh, other, other schools as well. So we're just inviting these kids in. We're trying to bridge the gap between what we're doing in schools and what we do at the centre. And uh, the goal and the idea is that uh, some of these kids who... Uh, who, uh, who, would, who would come to, to this event uh, will uh, end up at, say, soccer school, will, will not end up at summer camp, and they uh, will be and end up at, say, sort of other events that are, um, that, that are geared towards adults as well. So, love you to pray for that. We've got students coming. They're going to be involved in that. And say uh, that happens on the 10th, <coughs> the week beginning the 10th of June. So, love you to pray for that. And uh, we, we, we probably will do an open evening. I think maybe the Thursday evening of that week. We'll put the information out. And uh, just open it up to the general public. And uh, you can come in. And uh, you can get a little look at it yourself. See what the kids have been, been, uh, been looking at all week. Okay. That done. You didn't give me uh, this space for, uh, for, for publicity. Uh, it's to, to preach the word. So, uh, uh, 1 Corinthians 15 verse... Uh, 58. That is my emphasis this morning, and I just want to just reread this one verse. And it says, Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm, let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Now, uh, Paul has already used in 1 Corinthians, he's already used the, the, the term brothers and sisters, 28. 28 times, and here he, he reaches for a deeper, more endearing term, and he calls them my dear brothers and sisters. So he's reaching for the warmest terms that are available to him. Uh, the, the Corinthian church uh, have, have, haven't exactly proved themselves to be exhibit A of what a healthy, thriving church ought to look like. I listened to a sermon series a few years ago called First Christ, uh, Corinthians, Christians Gone Wild. And I think that is a very fitting term for the Corinthian church, Christians Gone Wild. Uh, they hadn't endeared themselves to Paul by making his life and service easy. In fact, it was quite the opposite. Uh, the opposite was true. He had, they'd proved themselves to be, to be more than fickle uh, they were prone to personality cults. They would uh, warm up to their favorite preacher and they would be all about that person. They were tolerant of sexual sin. Uh, it's, uh, some of the things that they, they tolerated would, would make our 21st century blush. This church had been anything but stable. And Paul's emphasis here in verse well, in, in, in the book at large, and uh, verse, uh, chapter 15 in particular, and verse 58, as a point of reference, if they are going to become stable, they need to get a firm grip upon the truth of the truth of the resurrection and its implications. That being it's on God's final plan for all people and all things if they were to be grounded and not so easily shaken. Now, three things. I always have three points. It's biblical, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. <laughs> Point number one. <laughs> Paul says this, I want you to stand firm. He says this in verse 58. I want you to stand firm. Or I want you to be steadfast. Now that word steadfast. Not that we're going to go into an in-depth word search here. But uh, because some of you are, are already sort of glazing over. Um, 
But really what, he's, what, what, what that word steadfast literally means is to be seated, to be securely seated, and settled, steadfast, situated. He says immovable. Uh, he says let nothing move you. He's saying this for, uh, for, for added emphasis. And we all do that, don't we? And Suffolk has its, has its own version of that. In Northern Ireland, we say, if we want to add a little bit of emphasis, we'll say, so it is. <laughs> if you go across the border into the Republic of Ireland, it'll be to be sure. So uh, David Wilding, he made, a, he made a password for us one time, and it was, so it is to be sure. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so it's just adding emphasis. Now, this instruction to be steadfast and unmovable can only be given because of the resurrection truth that is led down for the Lord's people, those who are in Christ, to rest on and to lean into continually. Now, this morning, we're all seated on chairs. Now, we are not just... um, We are not just imagining those chairs are there. There is a firm, solid structure. None of you look like you're about to fall over because you are completely resting in the structure that is not a figment of your imagination. And 1 Corinthians 15 is the most extensive treatment uh, given on the whole subject of resurrection anywhere in the New Testament. Paul highlights the rea- that the reality of the resurrection and, uh, and how the whole gospel message is hinged upon the resurrection being historically true. Not about it being my truth or truth for you or anything else. He highlights and underlines the nonsense, the utter nonsense of the gospel giving us any kind of hope if the resurrection, the bodily resurrection of Jesus is some kind of elaborate hoax. Paul says this, our preaching is useless in this earlier in the chapter. He says, you're still in your sins and we are deceiving people by telling people Jesus is risen if Jesus is not risen. You see, the resurrection is not just some kind of placebo. Do you know what? Do you remember those days in primary school? You know, when whether you were uh, you'd fallen over and bashed your head, or sprained your ankle, or even something a tummy bug or or anything. You know what the teacher would do? You know, they would wet the the blue paper towel, and it would even it would go on your head, even though it was your 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 ankle that you sprained. <laughs> It was, it was this kind of placebo effect. It was just sort of to, to make you a little bit more comfortable until your mother would come and for dear sake take you out of the building and get you out of the way. This is not what the resurrection is. This is not what the resurrection is. It is, it is a hope, a concrete hope, a concrete hope for our future. It is a hope for a newly resurrected body where the perishable, the old flesh and blood, the old bones that break and tendons tendons that tear, where we take off the perishable and we put on the imperishable. Paul is saying this, therefore, We can be steadfast. We can be situated. We can be settled and firmly situated not because of how we feel. There's a lot of emphasis these days on how we feel. Yes, but how does it make you feel? Well, a more important question is, is it true? And this is a concrete hope that we have. Not because of what we feel, but because of of what we know. The truth about the gospel is this. For the man, the woman, the boy, the girl who repents and believes recognizes that we are living in God's world our way instead of God's world 
his way and repents and believes that Jesus is their only hope for that person. That person is then tethered to a resurrected Jesus. Do you know the, the most popular, the most well-used term for someone in the New Testament being a Christian, and it's a much better term than the word Christian, is, is in Christ. Someone who is in Christ. And do you know what? Then in, in other places it says about, about, about Christ in us. So we are in Christ if we have repented and believed, but Christ is in us. So we are tethered to a resurrected Jesus. And that resurrected Jesus, his, 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 his life that he lived, and that record of right and life that he had, all, all those Ten Commandments, how he got them all right, credited to our account, his atoning death, removing our sins, and his resurrection with eternal implications for us also. Now, uh, for my birthday last year, I think it was, Cynthia, uh, I think Matthew must have convinced Cynthia, but because uh, some of you know we call Cynthia super safe Cindy. She doesn't, she doesn't like to take uh, too many risks. Well, Cynthia bought me a, a, a parachute jump. And I thought, well, well that was, that, that was she, Matthew must have got her on a weekday or something. I don't know. <laughs> uh, but, <laughs> but Becky tells me, who's done a parachute jump, that, that you are not just there. You don't just leap out of this perfectly good airplane. You're actually tethered to a professional jumper. And you're not standing on the edge thinking, will I jump? Will I not jump? Will I jump? Will I not jump? If he jumps, <laughs> you're gone. Like, <laughs> there's no decision to be made. And that's it with Christ. We are, if we are in Christ, we are tethered to. Um, I, when I was growing up, um, the, uh, there was this, uh, when, you, when you'd watch the news, and, and Janice, you can back me up on this, uh, the, you'd watch the news and sort of the, well, during the times of the troubles, there would always be this, this line that the loyalists, would, that the, the unionists would use in, in, in our uh, very diverse Irish politics, that say, uh, <laughs> one particular party, one particular party is inextricably linked with, uh, <laughs> with one uh, form of, of the paramilitaries. Inextricably linked. That word is, that phrase is burned into my brain. And if we are in Christ, we are inextricably linked to Christ. His death has implications for us. His resurrection has implications for us. Because he rose, we too will rise. How sure can I be that I will rise? I can be as sure that I will rise as sure as I am that Jesus did rise. Folks, that is the hope of the resurrection. That is the hope of the resurrection. And uh, in, in the passage that we read, so it says, and, uh, and, and we often ask the questions, well, what will it be like? What will it be like? What will my resurrected body be like? Well, I hope it's a little bit better than the one that I have. Um, I don't know, I imagine myself to be six inches taller. I don't know, but <laughs> <laughs> slightly more muscular. But um, what will it be like? Well, what we, well, we've got to look to the only resurrected body that we, that we know of, Jesus. Will we recognize each other? Yeah, I guess we will, because... Eventually, the disciples recognized Jesus in his resurrected body. What about the new heaven and the new earth? Well, what will that be like? Well, I suspect it's probably, if we want to know what that's going to be like, we've got to have a little look at, uh, at Genesis, Genesis 1 and 2, before the fall comes in in, in chapter 3. And I guess it's going to be a little bit like that. Um, one author uh, that I read um, he likened it, and I'm going to use my own illustration rather than his, but 
I remember when I was at Bible college, I, I had a little Mark II fiesta. Now, I'd say, I'd, I'd sort of done a little bit, bit of work on it. I was a, a mechanic in, in for a short period of time. And it ran, it always ran. And, and, and if there was a problem and I knew that it wasn't dangerous, <laughs> well, that can wait, all right? Ended up, I had this little car, this little Mark II Fiesta, a little blue Mark II Fiesta, and, and not really much, it was safe, like it was staying on the road, but there were things that just didn't work. And I suppose I got used to it, and it didn't really matter that it didn't work, until I would come home and I would get into my dad's car, and uh, my little car would take me from A to B, but my dad's car would also take you from A to B. But it was different. You see, his car was well-maintained. His car was a few models ahead of mine. And there were similarities, but it was just so much better. Now, this world that we live in is amazing. Um, we, uh, and for those of us who have, maybe those of us who have traveled, outside of our own four walls at least, we've seen some stuff and you just think, it is amazing. I remember the first time we, uh, Cynthia's sister took us to, uh, to Niagara Falls, just absolutely breathtaking. This is so amazing. And yet this is it in its brokenness. This is how it is. And what will it be like? It'll be similar, but just so much better. So much better. Folks, that is the hope of the resurrection. And this doctrine of, of what it will be when Jesus returns and, 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 um, and the old is made new, should not just be a placebo, but it should, gr it should uh, ground us in the difficult days and propel us forward in the other days. I remember um, when we were doing our building project, and I remember one very dismal day, and uh, Ben and I, and uh, Roy as well, and I think there was at least the three of us, and and uh, we, were, uh, we were trying to divert um, rainwater that was coming off one roof onto newly led, well, relatively newly led concrete. And I remember um, we were just trying to divert this and we were putting up emergency guttering and uh, I do remember tipping it in the wrong direction. And I like to think in my mind that, that Ben, that, that ben let, us, let, let us scream out of him, but I don't think he did, but it's more fun that way. Um, and I remember just out there thinking, this is the pits. But I also remember thinking, in a couple of hours' time, whatever happens, I'm not going to be here. It's going to be better than this. And this world affords us a lot of joy, a lot of joy, and a lot of privileges and pleasures. But this is nothing. This is nothing compared to what's coming. George Clark, or Gordon Clark, says this, a little paraphrase. He says this, be steadfast, be unchangeable, not erratic, not scatterbrained, or easily discouraged, and multiply your good works in the knowledge that the Lord will make them profitable. So it's the hope that we have as believers. The hope that we have as believers. And it's not on wishful thinking. It's on the hope of the resurrection. Second thing is this, and this one's going to be very brief. Uh, always abounding. Always abounding in the work of the Lord. Now, doesn't it sound really exhausting to be always abounding at anything? Always abounding. Um, but writing on the second coming and the resurrection um, to, to the new heaven and the new earth, John Piper says this about this blessed hope. He says, this confident hope gives us the encouragement and the enablement that we need for daily living. It does not put us in a rocking chair where we complacently await the return of Jesus Christ. Instead, it puts us on the marketplace, on the battlefield, 
where we keep on going when the burdens are heavy and the battles are hard. Hope, he says, is not a sedative. It is a shot of adrenaline, a spiritual blood transfusion. What is it in our darkest days that ought to keep us going? And it's this. The best is yet to come. The best is yet to come. This is good, but the best is yet to come. Always abounding. What does, that even, what does it even mean? Well, always abounding. It carries the idea of exceeding requirements. Uh, overflowing or overdoing. Now, about every 10 years, my, my old uh, uh, school reports come out. Generally, when I'm, uh, when I'm at home uh, back in Ireland, and uh, someone will pull it out and have a laugh and, and say, but it's, it's things like this that are said. Stephen, you need to wise up. Or could do better. Or, I don't know, please leave the school or something. <laughs> but you see, serving, the, uh, just when, when we, we uh, see our, our kids from Debenham, uh, their school reports, uh, one of the categories is this, meeting minimum requirements. Now, of course, none of my kids ever got meeting minimum requirements. Um, but it's, 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 it's the antithesis that is the antithesis of meeting minimum requirements you see in ephesians chapter 1 verse 7 and 8 uh, it's paul speaks of of how god lavishes lavishes his love upon us the riches of his grace and he's saying he's saying this that we should be a lavishing our service, our heart, our passion for Christ and for his kingdom. Uh, John MacArthur said this, uh, um, uh, he says in in relation to those verses, he says, uh, because God has done, has so abundantly overdone himself for us who deserve absolutely nothing from him, we should determine we put it in very commas, if it were possible, we should determine to overdo ourselves in service for him to whom we owe everything. Now, it doesn't mean that we'll skip through life with a, a, just with a, a song in our heart the whole time. This abounding will be determined by, by decisions that we make. Uh, Rebecca McLaughlin in her, in her little book, one of her little books, a little subtitle says this, grit is great. And uh, she makes the point that, uh, that sticking with a task, sticking with a task that we care about for a long time, even when it gets hard, is, makes more difference to long-term success than intelligence, talent, and good looks. Isn't that, does that make some of us breathe a sigh of relief? William Carey, who is known as the father of modern missions, said this. He said, I can plod. That is my only genius. Keeping going when the things get difficult. Not just meeting minimum requirements, but pressing on. That's all throughout the scriptures, isn't it? That say that we are called to grit, to persevere, to run with patience the race that is set ahead of us. Jim Elliot, he said this, say, he says, wherever you are, be all there. Live to the hilt every situation that you believe to be the will of God. So we are, we are to, to be always abounding in the Lord's work. And the last thing I want to just say is, is this. Because your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Now Paul's reference here to the, the work of the Lord, your labor in the Lord, is almost likely, is most likely a reference to gospel proclamation. 
uh, to discipling, to Bible teaching and grounding believers in their faith, to uh, uh, walking with people through difficult seasons of their life. This work of the Lord and the work of the Lord is, is hard. It's difficult, isn't it? And I, I think it's, it's uh, particularly difficult at, at this moment and as, as our uh, culture gets more and more and more secularized. It's difficult. And the Lord's work is hard because it's hard to measure. I, I've often thought about, say, sort of my, my days when I worked in the garage. It was very easy to measure. A car went, came in, it was broken. It went out, it was still broken. Uh, <laughs> no, it was fixed. <laughs> you can measure that. You can measure that. But how do you know? How do you know? It's hard because it takes patience. And of course, we're all endued with an immense amount of patience. It's hard because you're not in control. We all like a little bit of control. It's hard because we are completely and utterly dependent upon the Holy Spirit, whom we cannot manipulate. We can't do it. Rico Tice, uh, one of his lines that uh, that will be forever etched in my memory is this. We preach Christ. He opens blind eyes. We cannot do that. We cannot do that. All we can do is proclaim, teach, uh, share, shine like stars, hold out the word of life. And live a life of love. Just as Christ has loved us. And this is not in vain. Our labor in the Lord is, is not in vain regardless of, of the outcomes. Because being faithful, regardless of the outcome, is, is, is glorifying to him. Our labor in the Lord is not in vain because we don't see what God is doing. The five loaves and the two fish, God is able to, to do that. And this is where I want to just encourage you with this point before I wrap up and sit down. Uh, just last, last January, I think it was, I was sitting uh, at the barn, in the barn, uh, for, six, for 18 to 25 year olds. And uh, I was sitting there and uh, Calvin was leading from the front and uh, uh, Joe Grimwood, who was here last week, he came up and he, he spoke, he gave a talk. And uh, I was just sort of working the, the, putting the words up on the screen, you know, I think they send the old fogey to the, to the back, you know, contained, sort of out of the way. Um, and so I was sort of doing that, and then this young guy came, comes in, he sits beside me, and uh, we're at, it's all done, and make conversation with this young guy, and, and I just ask him where he's from. And he said this, he said, Stephen, here's a fun fact. He knew my name. He said, Stephen, here's a fun fact. He said, you came to my church uh, and spoke at my youth club when I was seven years old. And you said this, 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 and this. And I said, yeah, I often said that. <laughs> and he said, you know what? I went home that night and I just, I just gave my life to, to Jesus. And here he is sitting in his mid-twenties. I think, and I just envisaged in that moment driving home because I would go once a month they would book me once a month I would go home just driving home and say I would get home and I Cynthia would say you know kids are Matthew and Emily in bed Ben's there somewhere and uh, Cynthia would say to me uh, well how'd it go how'd it go I'd be like oh for goodness sake I don't know I just don't know. I don't even know if they listened. I don't even know sometimes whether it's worth my while or worth my effort. Um, I remember an, another morning uh, going to, uh, to speak at a church in Norfolk. And I remember, uh, I remember it just was, it was an absolute hash. Like, it was an absolute hash. And Cynthia, Cynthia said to me, as she does, as you can gather, um, well, how'd it go? <laughs> uh, oh, I, I remember just saying, it, it was just not worth my while. It was just not worth my while. And the pastor came to me several weeks later and he said, you know what, you, you said in your sermon 
you said in your sermon that, that we needed to have faith in Christ. Actually, it's something I, I, I spoke on it from memory. I, I, the, the message that I came with, I just ditched it. Never do that, never do that. Uh, I just ditched it. And I just, I, I said several things that went, at least it felt really badly. And, and it just, and the pastor came, he said, you said in your sermon that, um, that, that we need to have faith in Christ. This lady went home, Debbie went home. She opened up her Bible, went to Romans, got to chapter five. And in her own very simple way, gave her life to, to the Lord Jesus. Um, that's incredible. Um, just a few, week, mo- a few weeks ago, uh, we got a, an email from, from a, a mum who sent her, her son to, to soccer school just last year. And uh, you know what it's like. You know, you've got kids coming in. It's busy. You're just sort of milling around and, and doing what you do. And this lady, she sent us this, this email around March time. And she said, she said I really want to thank you for for what, what happened at, at soccer school last year. She said, you know, I just saw how kind all the leaders were to the children. And she said, I took you one of your little red books, which happened to be the Gospel of Mark, and she said, God has done something in my life. And, I've, and she says, and tonight I'm, I'm off to my first uh, Alpha course, I think it was. And you think, Really? And here's my conclusion. Here's my conclusion. I cannot give a children's, assuming I'm faithful to the word, I cannot give a Bible talk to children that is bad enough, that renders it powerless in God's hands. I cannot go to a church and preach a message terribly enough, if that's a word, to stuff it up for God. I cannot be uh, oblivious enough to people that something about, about the unconscious presence of the Lord Jesus among his people is nullified enough. Our labor in the Lord is not in vain. Our work with kids, those little sessions with our kids in Sunday school. Can God use, God can use anything. God can use anything. Our labor in the Lord is not in vain. We stay faithful to him. Teach his word, preach his gospel, live in a way that is, that is um, that where we don't have any glaring contradictions to to you know, where we're continually narrowing the gap between what the Bible teaches and how we live. And God can use it. Our labor in the Lord is not in vain. God can use our best of efforts. He can use our worst of efforts. And he can use it for his glory. Let's be encouraged this morning let's be steadfast unmovable always abounding in the Lord's work because you know this your labor in the Lord is not in vain it's not in vain it cannot be because God can take the five loaves and the two fish and he can feed a multitude and if he can take that he can take my least of efforts and use it for his glory and if he can do it for an Irishman like me, he can do for anyone like you. Amen.